بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين وصلى الله وسلم وبارك على عبده ورسوله الأمين نبينا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين Dear brothers and sisters in Islam السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته and welcome to mercy to the world صلى الله عليه وآله وسلم The Prophet صلى الله عليه وآله وسلم it was time for him after spending 13 years in Mecca under the tyranny of the Qurayshis, under the oppression, migrate with his companions to a safe haven, to a place where the nation of Islam, the Muslims would have their own sovereign country to be able to practice Islam, to be able to worship Allah, to be able to protect those who were interested and keen in embracing Islam. The Prophet وسلم, migrated to Ahmed. The Prophet migrated to Medina. Medina. Now, the Prophet وسلم, when going to Medina, it wasn't easy. And he had to pass a lot of difficulties to reach there. And one may ask, why? do the messengers of Allah have to face such difficulties? The answer would be that this is part of the training that Allah Azza wa Jal gives His messengers. And it's also part of their process of elevating their levels in paradise and granting them lots and lots of good deeds for their patience. If you recall, the messenger of Allah Noah had also difficulties with his people. If you also recall the messenger of Abraham, messenger of Allah, Abraham, also had to migrate and leave his country, his homeland, because of the oppression of his father and his people. His grandson, Jacob, and you all know that the father of Jacob was You have Abraham who had two sons, Isaac, yeah. Isaac, Isaac and Ishmael. Ishmael. And Isaac had a son who is Jacob. Yes. And Jacob had a son who was Yusuf, Yusuf Joseph. So the Prophet was once asked, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, who is the son of the generous or, 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 or noble people? So he told them, it is Joseph, the son of Jacob, the son of Isaac, the, the son of uh, Abraham, all prophets of Allah. So, even Jacob had to migrate and go to Egypt, and then the people of Egypt oppressed those, the sons of Israel, Bani Israel, and they themselves had to flee the uh, hardship and tyranny of uh, Pharaoh, and it goes on and on and on. And the last messenger before our Prophet ﷺ, Jesus Christ, may peace and blessing of Allah be upon him and upon all messengers of Allah, also faced difficulties with the Jews when they did not accept him and when they slandered him and did so uh, uh, awful things to him. That is why it's the same practice with our Prophet ﷺ, the final messenger of Allah. He had to migrate to Medina, and he had to fool the people of Mecca because they would not leave him. And he migrated when he knew that they were going to assassinate him. So he put his cousin Ali ibn Abi Talib in his bed so that they would be deceived by that and they would think that this was the Prophet himself. And he set on his journey with his companion Abu Bakr. As Siddiq, may Allah be pleased with him. Shaykh, what we can learn from this point that uh, Sayyidina Ali radiallahu anhu, he uh, sacrificed by himself and sleep in the bed of Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, that means that uh, he sacrificed by himself. So what we can learn from this point? Of course, nowadays, it's not as clear at, as it was in the old days. At the time of the Prophet alayhi salatu wasalam, each and every individual would be more than happy, would be 
willing to sacrifice his life for the life of the Prophet ﷺ. And in an Arabic, there is a, a statement that most of the companions would usually say that we give our mothers and fathers in your sacrifice, O Prophet of Allah. We're willing to sacrifice our own flesh and blood for your safety and for your life, the Prophet of Allah Azzawajal. Now, the, Ali ibn Abi Talib was the cousin of the Prophet He was about 16, 17 years of age. So he was a young man, a little bit older than or, or, or less. And he willingly did this knowing that there is a possibility that they may assassinate him instead. But he did this from his own self. He took the initiative. And he would consider to be, he would consider himself to be doing a great thing for Islam and for his cousin, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And of course, it's, it's a well-known fact to all Muslims that Ali ibn Abi Talib was one of the bravest soldiers of Islam. And we will get to know a little bit more and more about this great companion of our messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. We spoke about the journey itself from Mecca to Medina and we have to know that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam entered Medina on Monday and he stayed in Quba. Masjid Quba? Well, he, it, there wasn't a masjid at the time. Yeah. So he stayed at the outskirts of Medina for a number of days. He came on Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, and Friday. Friday. So he stayed there for five days. Yes. And the minute he came to Quba, he instructed them to establish or to build the Masjid of Quba. And the Masjid of Quba exists until this very moment. And the Prophet والسلام, told us that whoever prays two rak'ahs in that particular masjid, Masjid Quba, this would be equivalent to one umrah. So it's a great reward for those who visit Medina to go and pray in two that masjid two rak'ahs. The Prophet والسلام, as reported by Imam al-Bukhari in the Sahih, had a habit of going to Quba every single Saturday to pray in that masjid. Throughout his life or the remaining uh, life of his in Medina, 10 years. And it's about five miles away from uh, uh, Medina where he lived. And he used to walk that distance or ride every single Saturday. So it is a place worthy of us visiting and praying in whenever, inshallah, Allah grants us inshallah. this uh, uh, chance. Few days after the Prophet ﷺ migrated, his wife caught up with him. And if you recall that the Prophet ﷺ married after the death of his wife Khadija. And he married an old woman, Muslim woman, that's called... Khadija? No, Khadija was his first wife. first wife. When she passed away, he married another one. Her name was Sauda bint Zum'ah. So this was his second wife. And he also married Aisha, which was the, do the daughter of his Abu Bakr uh, companion, Abu Bakr mm -hmm. as-Siddiq. A few days later, they caught up with him. Uh, uh, Sauda, his daughter, Umm Kalthum, his daughter, Fatima, and also Usama ibn Zayd and, um, and his mother, Umm Ayman. They all caught up with the Prophet, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, in Medina. Now, the Prophet stayed there in Quba for five days. And then he sent to Bani and Najjar. And they are his uncles from his mother's side. And they came to protect the Prophet. ﷺ. They sent 100 of their armed men to accompany the Prophet ﷺ when he enters Medina. They came and they went with the Prophet ﷺ in a convoy that was very nice to look at. A hundred men in their arms protecting this man and his companion Abu Bakr. May Allah be pleased with him. They set off on Friday. But Friday prayer 
caught up with them in the middle of the way. So the Prophet ﷺ prayed with those who were with him in a, an area where they have now a masjid called Masjid al-Wadi, the, 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 the mosque of the valley. And then they went on to Medina. Now, the minute the Prophet ﷺ entered Medina, Anas ibn Malik, may Allah be pleased with him, the, the servant of the Prophet ﷺ, said that everything lit literally when the prophet came to medina the first day and everything the whole world Gushayi. turned into darkness yeah, when he passed away so he gives a comparison of when he came in and when he died the prophet sallallahu and this was in the hearts of the believers because they've anticipated this moment all of their lives he was the man that Allah Almighty guided them with to this beautiful religion. It was He who took them with the grace of Allah from the darkness into the light. So the minute He walked in to Medina, every single house was praying, was wishing, and was hoping that the Prophet would come and stay with them. Because it's an honor second to none. So the Prophet ﷺ, whenever some of his companions took the rope of the camel he was riding on to guide that to his house, he would say, leave the camel. Because Allah Azzawajal ordered that camel to do what it was told to do. So they left the camel. And it's a habit, it's a sunnah that the Muslims used to call their ride with names. So the Prophet used to call his sword Dhul Faqqar. The Prophet used to call وسلم, his camel. And, and the name of the camel was Al Qaswa. And Which means? It's a name. It's just a name. Just a name. So mm -hmm. if someone's name is uh, Ali, for example, it might have a, a, a meaning. But some names are just names. Mm -hmm. You call a city Jeddah or Cairo or London, it's a name. Mm -hmm. And also he had a mule that's called Juljul. So, and, and some dresses he used to name. So there are names and, and, and different uh, uh, names to things that he used to uh, uh, use, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. I believe that we have a, a short break. So inshallah, stay tuned. And inshallah, we will be right back. <laughs> So this is an open invitation for everybody to recognize God and enjoy His blessings in this life and His mercy in this life and in the hereafter as well. Allah, Ar-Rahman, Ar-Rahim. Each name has a meaning. Each name signifies a nature of Allah the Almighty which no one shares or is compared to Allah in it. Assalamu alaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh and welcome back. Before the break, we were talking about the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam entering Medina. So every one of the companions wanted to have the honor of hosting the Prophet alayhi salatu wasalam in his house. And the Prophet told them, leave it, leave the camel because it knows where to stay. It was ordered by Allah azza wa jal. So the camel went to the current location of the mosque. It went a little bit forward and then it went back again and the camel stayed there. So the Prophet ﷺ knew that this was the location and this was the place. One of the companions ﷺ was Abu Ayyub al-Ansari. And because his house was a bit close to the area, so without asking anyone, he took the luggage of the Prophet ﷺ, and took it inside his house. He didn't consult anyone. Because you have to seize the opportunity. If you wait, you're going to lose it. So the minute he went in, the people of the, the, the companions around the Prophet 
each sallallahu alaihi wasallam requested that they have the honor of hosting him because their house is closer so he said well a man follows his luggage so abu ayub took the luggage i have to follow him so he went and stayed with abu ayub al ansari may allah be pleased with him abu ayub had a house that had two floors so he insisted that the prophet alayhi salatu wasalam stays in the upper floor and the prophet told him sallallahu alayhi wasallam that it is more convenient for my companions and myself that i stay at the uh, uh, ground floor so that would be accessing me would be much easier than if i were to be in the second floor and abu ayub had to agree at the beginning and in one incident when the prophet stayed at the ground floor and he was uh, with his family on the top they spilled some water on the floor and they started putting all the clothes they had on that spot of water so that it would not leak on the prophet alayhi salatu wasallam they were afraid that a single drop would irritate the prophet alayhi salatu wasallam dropping from the ceiling and you just can imagine the love they had to the prophet alayhi salatu wasallam to the extent that not even one single drop they wanted to fall on him sheikh i want to I want you to tell us about the story because i heard the story that the prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam how he make the the companions uh, feel uh, familiar with which uh, was each other when they come to uh, al madina i heard a story about uh, companion abdul rahman and uh, sa'd ibn rabia mm -hmm. and uh, sa'd ibn rabia said to abdul rahman come and you can have a look to yes. one of my two wives and you can take one of them and you can share my money yeah when this she... this this was mentioned earlier and we spoke that the prophet alayhi salatu wasalam when he went to medina he had a problem because all of the companions that migrated from mecca they've left or they were forced to leave all their possessions so they did not take any of their wealth they did not have the chance to sell any of their property so they came without nothing without anything they were literally broke so the only way for them to share a decent life was to be compensated by the people of medina having said that the people of medina themselves were not stingy people they were generous believers so they came to the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam and told him o prophet of allah our farms our palm trees half of it to you and to your companions imagine giving half of what you own to strangers yeah no. yet the prophet did not approve of that so they told him okay how about if our brothers work in our farms as farmers and we split the fruit the, fruit. the, the, the harvest Together. between us yeah. So he agreed to that. So, so Medina was kind of a, a rich country, rich town. It was it, yes, it was an oasis. Mm. So it was in the middle of the desert, surrounded by mountains, mm. and it was the, the the land was so rich that it was filled with farms, palm trees, and so on, and all the caravans going to the north had to pass through Medina. Mm to get water and to get to do yeah. uh, trading, trading their own mm -hmm. trading mm -hmm. going back to your question ahmed the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam when he arrived in medina immediately he established a bondage between Ansar. those who migrated mm -hmm. and those who were actually the people of medina who were famous to be the called yeah. the ansar the ansar the supporters so he made a bondage between every muhajir every immigrant and one of the ansar by making them brothers so he said abd rahman ibn auf you who came from mecca and sa'd ibn rabi' who is from medina are brothers 
and Hamza ibn Abd al-Muttalib, the uncle of the Prophet, is the brother of so-and-so. Abu Bakr is the brother of so-and-so. Ali is the brother of so-and-so. And they had this bondage um, between them to the extent that if anyone died, his brother would inherit him. Abdurrahman ibn Auf was a rich merchant. But he came to Medina and he had nothing. So Sa'd ibn Rabia told him, this is my wealth. I'm one of the most richest people in Medina, Medina. Mm -hmm. take half of it and I have two wives I'll show you one of the, uh, 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 I'll show them to you yeah. and you have the right to choose one whomever you want yeah this to the extent that literally half yeah. of what I have is yours it's hard to imagine the, the feelings it is and it's extremely hard unless you don't like your wives yeah. <laughs> but, but this was not the case yeah. you have to imagine and remember that the Arabs at that time were extremely jealous people. They loved their wives and they could not allow anyone to talk at them or to say bad things about them. In Islam, if a person says a bad word against a woman who is a Muslim woman, if he does not bring four witnesses, he is punished yeah. by being uh, 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 lashed 80 times yeah. on his back because of this word mm. that he said. So if he says that this woman is, 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 has a bad uh, behavior, she's not clean, she's not honest, she's not uh, chaste, this is his punishment unless he has four witnesses. So they were jealous people. But this shows you the extent of the faith in their hearts that enables them to get rid of half of their, what they own to a complete stranger. They've just come to know a couple of weeks ago. It's the bondage of faith, Iman, and Islam that connected them. Uh, going on to uh, 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 the Prophet Sallallahu stay, now they've located, allocated this area where the camel had sat, and it was obvious that this would be the place for a masjid. So he asked the Prophet ﷺ about this area and he was told that it belonged to two orphans with the companion As'ad ibn Zrara, may Allah be pleased with him. So he started bargaining with the orphans to, to buy it from them and they refused. They said, no, this is for Allah and for his messenger. And the Prophet ﷺ insisted, because it is for uh, to Allah, it has to be bought. So he bought the piece of land. He started cleaning the piece of land. There were few palm trees. trees there were few uh, uh, graves for polytheists. Yeah. So he dug all of this out. He cut the trees. He fixed the land. And he used the trunks of these trees to build the walls and the ceiling, which was not a fancy masjid mm -hmm. as you may uh, 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 think it was a very basic masjid very, very simple very simple but the consequences that would come out of this masjid were unbelievable he uh, instructed his companions to start uh, building the walls with stones with uh, uh, clay and they built this masjid that would protect them from the heat of the sun from the wind and from the rain, though rain still fell in, and you can uh, uh, recall hadiths uh, from the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam prostrating in mud. So it wasn't just a masjid? Well, it wasn't, as we may call a masjid, a place for uh, uh, worship and prayer, but it was more than that. And we will come to this point, Sorry. inshallah, uh, uh, ahead of, uh, in time. Also, the Prophet had two rooms built for him and his wives so he had a room for Sauda and he has a room had a room for Aisha and at the time the Qibla was Masjid al -Aqsa. in the direction of al Masjid al-Aqsa in Jerusalem mm -hmm. so when he was in Mecca they used to pray to the north and that was not a very difficult thing to do because they had al Kaaba in between 
so they could always pray in the direction of Kaaba and in the direction also of Jerusalem. And we also have to know that the Prophet وسلم, when he went to Medina, though he spent only seven days, he built three masjids. The Masjid of Quba, the Masjid of Al-Wadi, and Al the Masjid of Medina, Masjid Al-Nabawi. Which indicates to us that the role of Masjid is not only a place of worship. It is far more than that. And we will get into this, inshallah, uh, uh, on a later stage. Now, it was time, as we have a masjid, to call the people to come and pray. And at the time of the Prophet, والسلام, they did not have means of fast communication. So, what was the logical thing to call? How, how was it easy for us to call people to pray? The companions has had the, their different opinions. Some said, why not have a bell like the Christians do? So whenever it's time for prayer, we ring the bell. Others say, why not have a horn like the Jews? So that whenever it's time for prayer, we blow the horn and people come. And the Prophet ﷺ did not like both uh, 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 ways because it was un-Islamic. My cameraman unfortunately tells me that this is all the time we have for today's program. But inshallah, when we meet next time, we're going to elaborate a little bit more about how uh, the...